explanation again, but didn't want to ask in class. There it is, over and over and over on YouTube, as many times as you want. Um, and I'll also send out text reminders for at least a while to remind you that those are being put up today. Okay. All right, here we go. We are going to need to use some numbers. Surprise? No. Okay. Um, so we're just going to talk about the classes of numbers and you know, what they're called and what they look like. Um, so let's start with that. Uh, there's natural numbers or whole numbers. Okay, these are pretty basic. The first numbers you ever used. Even before you came into school, you were learning how to count things, and these are the numbers you would use—the natural numbers or the whole numbers. You had nothing. You had one of something, two of something, three of something. That's all they are. So no parts of numbers. They are whole. They're whole numbers, and they're positive. Okay, integers. You can see. The box, the yellow box for integers, contains the white box for natural and whole numbers. So these are integers, but there are some integers that aren't whole numbers. Those would be the negative ones. And it goes. Um, so this little dot 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 means it includes all these, but it also includes all these negative, what we call negative whole numbers. That's kind of a misnomer, but um, they are numbers that are not portions of numbers, they're entire numbers, but they can be negative, okay? So like my daughter, she understands one or two of something. Uh, she barely understands three and forget about four and negative numbers in a way, she would have no concept of those. So we have these, these basic ones, then we expand our knowledge to negative numbers and uh, now we have rational numbers. Now the rational numbers contain all these guys. So all of these are rational numbers, but then there are some that aren't. Uh, there are some rational numbers that aren't integers or whole numbers. And those would be three-fourths, uh, two-thirds, one-half, uh, whatever, whatever you like. Um, just one, even negative two-thirds, or uh, negative numbers are included in that. So. One of the reasons that I want to tell you the names of these numbers is I want to be able to talk about them specifically. And so the definition of a rational number is one integer over another integer. So when I say integer, we know we're talking about all these guys right here. We're talking about positive and negative and zero, uh, not portions, entire numbers. Okay. So a rational number is any number that can be written as one integer over another, whether it be positive or negative. Um, and decimals can be uh, rational numbers too. If you can write them as one integer over another, it's a rational number. So there's 0.5, there's a simple one. 0.5 can be written as one over two, so it is a rational number. If we saw this as a decimal, it would be negative 0.6666. However many sixes we would want to write, it goes on for infinity. So I can't really write down that number because it has an infinite number of sixes. I can indicate it goes on forever with a little line right there, or maybe a dot, dot, dot. Um, but this line definitely tells me that six will keep happening. Right? It's not just a coincidence, and then the rest of the numbers are different. Right? So any number that goes on forever, any decimal that goes on forever, but also repeats, can also be a rational number. Okay? So any decimal that stops clearly can be written as a rational number, like, how about this point? One nine seven six three. I want to write that as a rational number, one integer over another. How would I write that? Oh, I have no idea. You guys should probably answer. Take one number and divide it by another number and wind up getting this. What a 19.763 over 100, 
that's equivalent to that, right? Now it's not an integer over another integer, so we're not quite there. But notice this. When you divide by 100, do you guys have some kind of a shortcut you use to divide by 100? Divide by 10, divide by 100,000, yeah? You just move the decimal point how many zeros? Yes, move the decimal that way to the left as many zeros as you have, whatever that multiple of 10, however many zeros it has. So divide by 100, move it over two spots. So we're getting there. But this needs to be an integer. Right now, it's not an integer. Can we like, extrapolate that out? Use that reasoning? So you got three zeros? Three zeros to this? Yeah. So give it, you got two zeros already, put three more zeros, and then I'll move the decimal all the way out. One, nine, seven, six, three, over. Okay, and three more zeros. Yeah, if we divide this by that, move the decimal over that many places, and I wind up with this decimal. Okay? So any decimal that what's called terminates, it terminates, it stops, you could just go out. Um, well, you could divide by as many zeros as you need to move the decimal back, or you remember place value. Right? What, what place is this? The tenths. Next. What's that for ten thousands? Hundred thousands. Let's look here. Hundred thousands. Right? Got the hundred thousand there. Okay. That was nice. Okay, now we also have uh, we're we're inside this set of numbers called the real numbers. There's all the numbers, are the real numbers. We talked about rational numbers. All the numbers we talked about so far are rational. You can write them as one integer over another. Terminating decimal or any decimal that repeats, like 0 0.167, 167, if that repeats forever, uh, we could write that as a one integer over another. It's not as easy as this one, but it definitely can be done. Um, but an irrational number is one that's a, a decimal that goes on forever. If it stops, we, it would be a rational number. It goes on forever, but it doesn't repeat. Like pi? Like pi. Pi is an irrational number. Okay. And that's probably, I put my money on it being the only one that most of you know. Maybe some of you know another irrational number by name. Okay. You can make one up, but you'd be here forever. You just would, uh, you just have to sit there and say random numbers that don't repeat forever and ever. Uh, or we could define it like, what is pi? How do we find pi? 3.14. How is it defined? What's pi related to? Circle. There we go. Circle. Okay. Circle. What about a circle? You're doing better than any of you. Come on. All right. I pulled it out of you. Circle. We got a circle. Well, it's. You look at a circle and you take. What's this? Circumference. Yes, yeah, very good. Circumference. What's this? Uh, so diameter, all the way across diameter. Anybody want to throw it out there now? Oh, the radius. No, no, the. It is diameter. Well, we got the parts name. Circumference, half diameter. Half What's pi? Half of it? Half of it? No, because that could, you know, that could be anything. Something about the circumference and the diameter together forever. What could it be? The circumference divided by the diameter? Hey, that's not a bad. Yes, even if you didn't know for sure. Look at the circumference, right? Bigger than the diameter, right? Yeah. Divide the circumference by the diameter. Do you think you could fit three of these around the edge? Sure. Or maybe a little bit more? Maybe. Like maybe 0.14 more than three? Sure, right? There's yep. three 0.14, 159, whatever diameters are going around the circumference. So yeah, that, it's just the circumference over the diameter of the circle. And that's how that's defined. Okay. Not that you need to know that, but why not? Just throw it out there. There's numbers like e and phi and uh, just tau and just 
just all sorts of different numbers that have names. Okay? So they're out there, they exist. We're going to be dealing with these for the most part, at least in our near future. In the near future, actually, we'll be dealing exclusive with the, exclusively with those. Anybody use imaginary numbers before? We have in algebra 1. I'm pretty sure you have. But we won't yet, okay? We're not focusing on imaginary numbers for anytime soon. It'll be this year, but it won't be soon. Okay, so in dealing with these rational numbers, which are real numbers, um, there's some properties that they have. Properties that real numbers have, um, what, we, what we call over their operators. Okay? Do you know what the operators are in real numbers? What operations can you do? Multiply, subtract, add, all that stuff. Now really, the only, the only operators there are are addition and multiplication, right? If we subtract, what are we doing? Adding negative numbers. Negative number. That's subtraction. If we're multiplying, or if we're dividing, we're really multiplying negative numbers. You don't have to multiply by negative numbers to, to divide, right? By some fractions. Yeah, multiply by fractions is the same as dividing. Okay. so. Closure. These real numbers have properties over the operations addition and multiplication. Okay? So properties, that's not going to work. Properties over addition and, and multiplication. So the closure says that if A and B are real numbers, these things are true. A plus B. What kind of a number do you think you're going to get when you take a real number plus a real number? A what? Real. Another real number. Okay. So A plus B is also real. Okay. And A times B is also real. That's what you call closure. You cannot escape the real number system by adding two real numbers together or multiplying two real numbers together. That'll never happen. You'll never multiply two of these together and somehow wind up in imaginary numbers. Uh, it's interesting, though. It's not, that's not true for imaginary numbers. You can multiply imaginary numbers and get back over to here. Right? Yes? Can you go over like an imaginary number? Oh, it, I will when it's relevant. I want you to see. You know, the scope of numbers, realize we're not going to be using these for a while. I'll go over what that is. I mean, I can tell you what it is. The imaginary unit, okay, the unit in real numbers is 1. And the imaginary unit is the square root of negative 1. Okay? And then we put that, like, we can take the square root of negative 2, and that's an imaginary number 2. It's kind of breaks down into the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 2. Um, and we call this i. And then what that does, we'll deal with later. Okay. Um, why we use it and all that stuff. Commutativity. A plus B. So this is this yellow is addition. This will be multiplication over here. Um, A plus B is equal to. What do you think? Who remembers commutativity? A plus B, the same as. B plus A. B plus A. It's the same. 3 plus 5 is 5 plus 3. 2 plus 7 is 7 plus 2. Negative 3 plus 5 is 5 plus negative 3. It's all the same. Associativity. A plus B. Okay, we do that. Then we add C. Be the same as? C. Well, we'll just deal with associativity, so it's true. Yes, that is true. But associativity just says we can concentrate our efforts on B and C first, and then do A. Right? And that's what it says. OK, and I'll just uh, put the counterparts for multiplication over here. A times B equals B times A. B times A. And A 
times b times c, if you do a and b first, it would be the same as if you did b and c first. So what this is bringing to our attention is that when you add numbers and multiply numbers, how many can you multiply together? Or how many can you add together at one time? Who said two? Two? Only two. Can you multiply three numbers together? No, you can only multiply two and then take that and multiply by another number. Okay, so now you've multiplied three together. Okay. So you have to concentrate on two numbers at some point, and whether you do these first two or these last two, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. Okay? Now, I'm not gonna test you on this and I put this on the test to make sure you know it and mark you down if you don't know it. Okay, but it's gonna be very useful for you to know. Uh, like it was just part of your everyday vocabulary, so that when you ask me a question and I talk about the commutativity of multiplication, you remember, oh, he's just saying that I can flip the order like that. Okay? Let me give you a little helpful tip on probably why they even named these the, the way they did in the first place. Okay? What, are the, what are the numbers doing in this property? What are they allowed to do by the rule of commutativity? Switch physical positions. They're actually allowed to move where they are. Okay? What's the root word of commutativity? Huh? Well, ativity, right, is like a, a, a suffix that we put on the ends of lots of root words. What's the root word? Commute. Commute. And what does it mean to commute? If you commute, what does it mean? Travel. travel. And did these letters, did these numbers travel? They did they actually move? If I commute, usually we're talking about to work. I commute from down the road to work, and I commute from work down back to my house. Okay? So that's actual movement happens. Commute means to move. And this is the property where they move, they commute. What does it mean to associate? <coughs> Root word of associativity. Associate. Two people associate. What are they doing? Communicating, looking at each other, talking, doing something, right? So, let's see. I just had one. Um, which one? Carl. 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 And Dawan and Sarah. Yes, okay. So, Carl and Dawan can talk to each other, associate. Do they have to move? No, no they just, they associate. It's just they're talking. And then Sarah could be added to the conversation later, okay? Or Dawan and Sarah start talking, and then Carl comes in later, and they go, they're having a conversation, right? Does that make sense? The association, what I'm trying to get you to see, is just the turning and interacting, right? So whoever associates first, it doesn't matter. These guys or these guys, it doesn't matter. But they're not, they don't have to go anywhere. They don't have to commute. They're just associating, they're turning, they're looking at each other, they're giving each other attention. So associativity, associate, is just who interacts first. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Anything at all? Do I have a trail or anything? Okay. Whoa. That's a white page. Um, deal with some fractions, okay? So fractions, maybe you feel comfortable with them, and maybe you don't. The most likely thing, my experience as a math teacher, if I approach somebody about fractions, the most likely thing is they're not gonna be comfortable talking about fractions. I don't know why. Uh, you just all need to remain calm. They're not that difficult, all right? But this will be the last time that, we, that I teach it to you. And I'll go into depth, however in depth you want me to go. Um, my hope is you come out the other end fraction experts because I've just connected all the stuff that's already in your brain. All right. So first, let's talk about adding fractions. So if we had two thirds plus three fifths. Okay. Now, if we were in fifth grade and you were seeing this for the absolute first time, I wouldn't do it this way. But you know already. Can you add these fractions together? Right now. No. As they look now, no, not yet, right? 
It is possible to add them together and get a result, but we can't add them the way they look right now. That's what my point is, right? Okay. <coughs> so, what do we need? Now, if you, if you struggle with common denominator at all, uh, it's because you don't fully understand why you need a common denominator. Can anybody express to me why you need a common denominator to add these fractions together? Um, so that they could be the same fraction on them. Okay. They can, yeah. Yes. They'll be the same in some way, right? Yeah. They're different right now. What will be the same about them when we, don't just say they'll have the same denominator, that's clear, okay? But what will be the same about them? The fraction that's like on the hood. Yeah, yes, yeah. you're right. It's hard to express, right? Yeah. It's hard to express exactly what we're talking about. If I add these together, let's say I add these together to thirds and three fifths, and I say I have uh, five, right? Five what? Huh? Eighths. Eighths? Okay. Okay, well, let's see if we believe that. Okay, we got uh, thirds. Two of those thirds, right? Two thirds means I have two uh, pieces. Okay, and three of those pieces would make up the whole. And then over here we have three fifths, similar. Five pieces makes the whole, and there's three of them. Okay, so let's um, wonder if this could be five eighths. Okay, let's wonder if this could be five eighths. Well, let's look at five eighths. Eighths, right? Let's cut into eight pieces. And so here's one, two, three, four, five. That's five eighths. Okay. Now I know you're not thinking this every time you look at fractions, but if you look at it now, does it seem reasonable that two thirds plus three fifths is five eighths? No. Why? Tell me why. No. Carl? Because if you add it up, the first two is more than one. Yeah, you can just look at it. This counterexample is helpful because I can just see that. This big chunk of pie plus this big chunk of pie would be more than one whole pie, and now we're somewhere where this looks like less than either of these. Okay, so that can't be it. Okay, that's at least a counterexample to to what we're thinking. Um, so it can't be five eighths. That can't be the way it goes down. Um, well, let's use these pies to explain why we need five common denominators. You can see them here. If I tried to add these two to these three and say I had five, you would have trouble telling me five what's, right? Like, if you have, I'm going to try and draw apples. Uh, it's kind of an apple. I don't know. The red chef has a usual part. Um, <laughs> not good apples. Uh, these are oranges. These are good oranges. Um, if you add those two together and you say you have five, five what? Five fruits. Yeah, you could call them fruits, but then to add these together and say you have five, what, fractions? That's not going to work. Okay. Now, the analogy isn't perfect because there, there is no way that they could unify these other than to say fruits or things, right? You can, you can classify them, but they can't be the same thing. Integers? Huh? Integers? Integers? Like five, you're saying five integers? Yeah, there's five, because uh, there's, there, there's five, there's, there's a, not, they're not pieces of apples and pieces of oranges, they're definitely five uh, integers. But that's what I'm saying, like the analogy is that it doesn't work great because there, there's, there's no way to make these the same thing, absolutely. They can be related to each other, just like these are fractions and they're related to each other. Um, but to, we can, because what we're talking about is how big these things are, right? To say this is a third and this is a fifth, we're just talking about how big the pieces are. Can we make these pieces somehow the same size as these pieces? Mm. Or the pieces in this pie to be the same size as the pieces in this pie? Yeah. Yes? How? Multiply. 
No, no, I'm talking about pies. Oh. We'll, we'll, we'll apply subtractions after we oh. talk about it in pi. Oh. So how do I get the, the pieces in this pie to be the same size as the pieces in this pie? Cut them. Cut, cut, okay, I'll cut these. Cut these out. Let's look at this one. Cut this one half. Into what? Into fifths. Okay, if I, if I simultaneously cut these into fifths, and these into what? How would I cut these pieces that are already in fifths? Into what? Thirds. If I cut each piece into thirds, if I cut these thirds into fifths and these fifths into thirds, then how many pieces will I have here? And how many here? Okay, now are they the same? That's why we need common denominator. Because the, the denominator is saying, this is how many pieces makes up the whole. So we need to compare similar sized pieces. Okay? So we cut these into fifths, these into thirds, and now we have fifteenths in both of them, and that's what we need to do with the fractions. So we took the, the, every piece in here, Right, all the pieces together that make the whole, and we multiply that by 5. Right, so we multiply the pieces by 5. Okay. But clearly the two pieces that we're talking about specifically also got multiplied by 5. There's 5 times as many total pieces, and there's 5 times as many parts of the whole uh, that we're talking about. Over here, we did the, a similar thing, but there's 3 times as many now. So we multiply this by 3, multiply this by 3. What is 5 divided by 5? One. One. 1. We're multiplying this by 1. What happens when you multiply a number by 1? It stays the same. So we don't change 2 thirds as a number. It still is worth 2 thirds when we write it as 10 fifteenths. And this still is worth 3 fifths. We're still multiplying it just by 1. We're just multiplying it by a, a form of 1 that works for us. So here we have 10 fifteenths, and here we have 9 fifteenths, and altogether we have 19 fifteenths, and that is more than one in one whole. Right? It's one whole, and how much more? Four, four fifteenths. Four of those fifteenth size pieces. That's helpful if, I mean, I've met lots of people in algebra 2, calculus, calculus, still having trouble with fractions. Um, it shouldn't be. Uh, and I think that, that one of the problems is maybe you didn't quite get it conceptually, and so you just moved on to remembering how to do it um, procedurally, and then the reason why you did it escaped you, and so you'll forget to do it, or you do, you'll do it incorrectly, or because um, you won't quite understand why it's happening, why you need to do it, uh, and it, it slips your mind, so I hope that helps. Um, if we follow this reasoning, could we subtract fractions? Yes or no? Can we subtract them? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same process, right? We still need common denominators. We still do some bind the numerators together. The denominators don't change, right? That's what another mistake that happens a lot. The denominators remain the same because the denominator is just referring to how many pieces make up the whole. And that truth doesn't change when you collect a bunch of those pieces together. So it's not 30 it's, it's just still. There's 15 pieces in the whole, and now I have 19 of them rather than 10 or just 9, and together we have 19. All right, now talk about fractions, still we'll talk about multiplying fractions. How do we multiply fractions? Straight across. How many of you want to cross multiply? You want to cross multiply. It's common, it's a common thing. Okay. Let me just remind you of where cross multiply, how it got in your brain, and, and just maybe show you that it's just stuck in the wrong place in your brain. So if you had something like two-thirds, 
and that was equal to x over 9. Okay. This is called a proportion. When we set two fractions equal to each other, we give that the name, a proportion. Um, these two, they're proportionate to each other. So we just want to find out what x is. So here's cross multiplying. Cross multiply 2 times 9, 3 times x, divide by 3, x is 6. Okay? See what's going on there? So you got the cross multiply. It is a, a term that you were taught. But it's just been lodged in the wrong place. You remember it in the wrong context. We want to multiply fractions. We want to multiply just straight across. So 6 fifteenths. Okay. Any questions about multiplying fractions? Multiply straight across. Okay. Now if I were to take 2 thirds and divide it by 3 fifths, now I'm dividing fractions. Dividing fraction is kind of a weird thing to think about because I know what it means to divide by 3. Right? I take this thing, whatever it is up here that I'm dividing by 3, and I cut it into 3 pieces. Okay? To cut something into 3 fifths pieces, conceptually, that's weird. That's a lot more difficult to understand. Okay? So to at least make these problems manageable, what do we do instead of dividing by 3 fifths? Okay, Re multiply by the flip it over has a name. Reciprocal. reciprocal. With reciprocal of what? Uh, three fifths. Uh, three fifths? Are we sure it's not two thirds? I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure? Yeah. Okay, let me just show you that we can be sure that it's reciprocal of the denominator. Okay, we know from our experience over here we can multiply with the numerator and denominator by the same thing. Whatever it is, as long as it's the same. So if I do something really convenient, like multiply this by five thirds, what nice thing happens here when we multiply this by 5 thirds? The same, so it's 1, so, three, so 15 over 15 is just 1. Okay. So now this, this guy will have a denominator of 1. What happens when you divide by 1, or you have a denominator of 1? It's what? Yeah, it stays the same. Like You don't need to write something over a denominator of 1. Like you can ignore a denominator of 1. So that's nice that the denominator is now 1 uh, and can be like not part of the problem anymore. You can just take it to be this number up here. But we can't just multiply the denominator by a number. We have to multiply the numerator as well. Okay, So we are just multiplying it by 1. So nothing's changing. Uh, but now the problem becomes the same as 2 thirds times 5 thirds. Divided by 1, we don't need to even write that one in the next step. We get 10 over 9. 10 times. So you got adding, subtracting fractions. And you've got multiplying and dividing fractions. We're about to say goodbye to fractions. In a way, in the, say goodbye to the explanation of fractions. Are there any questions about fractions you feel like you don't understand? Now again, if it's just sort of fifth grade, we spend a lot more time on it. But we've all been taught fractions, and I'm hoping to clear up any confusions. And if there is still confusion, then feel free to ask. And if not, then just go on to the next thing. All right.
2 to the second power. Okay. In general, that's how we would say it. 2 to the Two to the fifth power doesn't have a special name, but two to the second power is a, a special name. It's called squaring. Anybody want to take a stab at why it might be called squaring? Because it's squared. In, in what ways? What I mean, your your notion of a square as a as an object. Why might this be called two squared? Okay, it's multiplied by itself. In what way is that like a square? All the sides are equal in a square. So if this square were 2 by 2, why would we multiply 2 by 2? Find all the sides. It's the area of this, of this triangle. So the, the area of this is 2 to the second power, or a square. Okay. How about? This, this is 2 to the what power? Third. 2 to the third. You can just call it 2 to the third. And does that have a special name? Cubed. cubed. Why might this be called 2 cubed? It's like a cube. It's like a cube. To find the volume of a cube. So if a cube had all the sides 2, 2 by 2 by 2, to find the volume of this cube, we would multiply length times width times height, and you would get 2 the third power would be the volume of this cube. So we just cubed the two. We just squared the two over there. So this means two times two times two. Or three factors of two. What's a factor? Something that goes into that number? Yeah, goes into though is is less mathematical than it could be. Would you say it goes into it? If two is a factor of, well, what, what's this number? Eight. eight. So when we say two is a factor of eight, like what makes two? Uh, how, does, how does two defined as a factor of eight? Using as many math words as you could possibly think. Uh, yeah, you multiply two by something to get eight. It's strictly. Multiplication, operation of multiplication is used to take two times something else and get eight. Okay, so a factor is something you multiply to get another number. Okay. Now, let's say we're looking at x cubed, or sorry, x squared. And let's say we want to let x be negative five. And here's, here's the thing I want to draw your attention to. What, what does that mean? What am I going to do with this negative 5? Substitute it for x. Just substitute it for x. Okay. Did I substitute it for x? Well, it depends on how you're thinking about it. Okay. Um, what is supposed to happen to x? Square it. Okay. Uh, and what is x? And now the problem is, how do these square numbers work? How do these exponents work? What number do they apply to? The base, yeah. And what's the base? Well, according to the way I've written it, it's 5. Negative 5, actually. The way I've written it, it's 5. It's supposed to be negative 5. How can I make sure that you know it's supposed to be negative 5? Put parentheses. Put parentheses around. Okay. Now, a couple things can happen when you do this. Okay, it's your own work. It's all. It's really up to your notation. And if your notation gets you there, I can't really argue with it. Sometimes people will see this notation as meaning negative five is the base. Negative five times negative five gives me twenty-five. Sometimes they do this correctly, but they substitute it incorrectly, and they'll get well five times five is twenty-five, and there's a negative sign, so negative twenty-five. Right? That makes sense. So it's important. This, the way you write this, uh, and the way you write this, um, it depends on who's reading it as to what that means, right? If I were to read it, I'd be really strict about it, and I would say, you're telling me to take two factors of five and apply them together and apply a negative to it. 
And here you're telling me, take what's inside the parentheses and square. Take it and multiply it by itself. Right? So if you're working on a test or something like that, and, and this communicates what you're supposed to do correctly to yourself, uh, great. But the problem is, if I write this on a test, what I mean is, what I just said, square 5 and then give it a negative. Right? And anybody who writes a math book is going to mean the same thing as I do. Um, so you're going to want to realize that this is problematic. You might want to start putting parentheses around that stuff so that the difference between your notes and what I might write or what the textbook might write doesn't confuse you. Okay. Um, so now, we're going to talk about the, the order of operations, all right? Which is dull. And uh, I'm going to show you a video from a guy that I like, and hopefully, uh, oh, lots of tabs, lots of tabs. Uh, let's see. You're going to have to watch an ad. That's the only way to escape it. If you went to elementary school in the U.S., or much of the rest of the world, you almost certainly learned about something boringly called the order of operations. A set of rules for whether or not you should do multiplication before addition or addition before subtraction to get the right answer from your math test. Except, you don't always get the right answer, or even one answer. I mean, is 8 minus 2 plus 1 equal to 5 or 7? And is 6 divided by 3 divided by 3 equal to 2 thirds or 6? The problem is, focusing on the order of operations can lead to ambiguity and obscures the real, underlying, and often beautiful mathematics. A mathematician will tell you that 8 minus 2 plus 1 is really 8 plus negative 2 plus 1, which is unambiguously equal to 7, even though the so-called order of operations standard in the U.S. tells you the answer is 5. If you want 5 for your answer, then you really need some parentheses. But why is this ambiguity even possible? It's because fundamentally, all of these operations are simply different procedures that start with two numbers and combine them in some way to give you one number. Each operation takes two numbers as input, two and no more. If you want to be entirely unambiguous and pedantic, every single pair of numbers in any algebraic expression should be inside parentheses. And then there's no need to know any order of operations. Just evaluate the innermost parentheses first and work outwards, collapsing them down pairwise like a championship's bracket. But it turns out that's not the only way. It's possible to change the order in which you do the operations, to rearrange the parentheses, as long as you know what the underlying mathematics is. For example, if you want to add 3 plus 4 and then multiply the result by 5, you can either do the addition first and get 7 times 5 equals 35, or you can do the multiplication first, as long as you know that multiplication distributes across all the terms in the parentheses. That is, 5 times 3 plus 5 times 4 equals 15 plus 20 equals 35. The same answer. And how do we know multiplication distributes? One way is to draw rectangles, but I've done that before. The same rearranging can be done for exponentiation and multiplication. 3 times 2 all squared, or 6 squared equals 36, is the same as 3 squared times 2 squared, 36. It even works for addition and subtraction. 5 minus 1 plus 2 is 5 minus 1 minus 2. So the true order of operations is this. Use parentheses and learn what exponentiation, multiplication, addition, and the rest are really doing. Then you can proceed however you want. That's not to say that we don't have a conventional order of operations in mathematics. I mean, deciding that we evaluate multiplication before addition allows us to get rid of lots and lots of redundant parentheses. And noticing that 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, and 2 times 3 times 4 equals 2 times 3 times 4, removes a ton more. But the point is that those parentheses are still there, still implied, just like how 3 minus 4 is secretly implying 3 plus negative 4, and 3 divided by 4 is really 3 times 1 fourth. 
But anytime the result might be ambiguous, you really need to use parentheses. Then you can proceed in whatever order you want. The order of operations learned in school, however, is different. It's a mechanical set of instructions that dictates just one of the many ways you can do algebra. It locks you into a single path through the beautiful mathematical landscape, which, while necessary for a computer whose goal is merely to give you the right answer, doesn't really give any insight onto what it is that you're doing when you do algebra. So while the order of operations isn't technically wrong because most of the time it'll give you the standard answer, it's morally wrong because it turns humans into robots. This Minute Physics video was brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy. Okay. So, you see the saying? No? No. No. Okay. This is order of operations, and we know the order of operations to be PEMDAS. Right? Like this. I'll write it like this. Exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, let's see. Oh, 48 divided by uh, 2 times 9 plus 3. Okay? Okay, two really common answers. So here's why I bring this up, because I thought it was very funny. Um, I follow a, a few people, subscribe to a few people on YouTube, and one of them uh, is a, a guy who makes math videos similar to the ones I make, uh, just helping people out. He's got a lot of followers, and I just try to figure out what does he do good, what can I emulate, what can I improve on. So. He explains really complicated things like calculus and physics and stuff like that. And he put this up one day and said, yeah? Have you heard of Khan Academy? Yeah. They had to do that at Big Sky. You did that? Yeah, they made us make an account and everything. Oh. Yeah, I thought, well, I know Mr. Parsons is doing that. I think it's a pretty cool idea. Still thinking about it. Um, so, in my videos that I make are a lot like the Khan Academy. This other guy, you see his hands in the Khan Academy, you don't. You just see kind of like this. Um, so he, this guy explains complicated concepts, puts this on his screen and says, I, you know, I want some help with this. 
some people ask me this and I got I got stuck on it. I thought, oh, that's silly, this is a very simple problem. Right? And I got an answer for me. And then I looked at the comments and I realized what he was doing was starting a discussion like what we're talking about. Okay. Um, how many of you got two? How many of you got 288? Okay. Well, here we go. Well, I think we can agree. It's clear that we should get 12 in feather parentheses, yeah? Okay, we should definitely get 12. 48 divided by 2 times 12. Okay, so here's where it separates. Okay, we can either multiply uh, these together first. Let's put that over here since they're on the side. Right. We can multiply those together first. We get 48 divided by 2 times 12 is 24. And that, of course, would leave us to 2. Here, we'll get uh, 48 divided by 2 is 24 times 12 is 288, which is right. Go ahead. Blast your competition with how right you are. Because aren't you supposed to go left to right? So you get 48 divided by 2 first, and then multiply by 12. OK. Counter. Rebuttal. Multiplication comes first. Multiplication comes first. It's multiplication division from left to right, though. Left to right? Yeah. It's both of them in the same state. Who's right? Oh. Who is right? <laughs> okay. Can anybody be right about this? Someone has to be right. Is there a right, <laughs> is there a, is there a right answer and a wrong answer? Yeah. What did you get? Oh, I won't say. Quite yet. But I was very sure I was right, and then I realized, oh, some, some other reality. Okay? Is there a right answer and a wrong answer to this? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of have to use the right answer. Hmm. Well, no. there's an intended answer. How about that? Like somebody, let's imagine somebody wrote this down and wanted you to get a number. There's a number they wanted you to get. Yeah? So, like, the person who wrote this down, would they like put imaginary parentheses around the two and then the other parentheses and then like bigger ones are you supposed to do last around the 48 and then the rest of the problem? Well, here's the, this, I mean, that would be unambiguous, right? That's what he was talking about, ambiguity and, and not ambiguity, in an ambiguity. I don't know what the word is in my text. Non-ambiguity. Um, to be clear, of what you want, you need to be clear. So what do they want you to do? Do they want you to do this first, right? And then clearly you would take the result of the parentheses and divide 48 by the result. Or did they want you to do this first? Divide these two and then multiply the result by that result. What did they want you to do? Can you answer that question? No, the problem is okay, there's not a right and a wrong there's a poorly worded phrase, okay? You ever read a sentence that's confusing? The wording's confusing? You're not sure, like you know all the words, but you can interpret it two different ways, right? There, those exist. Do you mean to do this? Are you talking about this thing or this other thing? What are you talking about? And that's exactly the problem here, okay? So, that, is, that Like he said in the video, there's not to say that there's not some order that we subscribe to, but there isn't, like math does not dictate that something be done first over something else. Parentheses dictates that, and then whatever's in the parentheses, that's what we do. Am I being clear? Okay. But because we don't want to put parentheses all over the place and uh, mathematicians are, are the kind of creature that wants to use as little ink as possible. We like to create uh, shorthand, okay? Now one of the shorthands is this PEMDAS thing. We agree parentheses, that it even shouldn't be part of it, that's obvious, that's why you use parentheses, but okay, so parentheses is first. Okay. Then, then exponents, right? We agree to do exponents first, because if I do 3 times 2 to the third, you could do the multiplication first, 3 times 2, and then raise it to the third. Okay? That's not to say you're wrong 
if you do it that way, but we will follow an order of operations, and I will say, according to the order of operations we agreed to, that would be wrong. Three times two to the third. If I wanted three times two to the third, I could do that and put parentheses around it. Now it's very clear. But exponents comes first, so I would do this first, and then this. Multiply the result by that, right? But the way I've written it, there's, there's nothing telling you you have to do that unless I tell you that you have to do that. Does that make sense? So mathematically, there is no right and wrong. It's just what we decide, okay? And I'll tell you what we will decide, how we would do this problem, how I would intend you to do this problem um, in a minute. Um, it was interesting when he posted this, people, like within an hour, 500 comments, just cursing at each other, and if they could, they'd be yelling at each other about <laughs> whether it's 288 or two, getting very, Upset. But you know what it came down to it was my teacher taught me this way, my calculator gets this answer. These are not mathematically mandated things, calculators getting certain answers and teachers telling you certain things. Okay? It's it's not a perfect system. And the real problem is it's just not being clear using this symbol rather than like maybe a big line that's more clear. It just makes what you want more obvious. Um, but the way I was taught. The way our calculators do do this order, the way uh, the book does it, would get 288. Okay. Um, so if I were to give you this problem, for one thing, I'd be more clear. Okay. Um, I would definitely, if I wanted you to get 288, I'd write it this way. Or um, wait, did I say? Yeah. What am I doing wrong here? No, I want no. What I would do, not that way. I would say forty-eight over two times nine plus three. That's what I would tell you to do. There's no way you could not get two eighty-eight that way. And the other way you could. So I, I'll be more clear. There are things that we'll subscribe to, and the way we will do it in general is like this. Like Carl said, this, the standard for the classes I've taken, um, for, for every math that I've seen pretty much in America, that's how it's done. In, I think a lot of European countries, it's taught multiplication is first absolutely every time. Um, but here we say, just work from left to right. So division comes first. Division is no better than multiplication according to, to this. Uh, so do division because it comes first from left to right and then do the multiplication. That's the standard. Yeah? So if you're not, because technically division is just multiplying by a fraction. Yeah. So what are you saying? Like that we just work from left to right because there technically is no division or subtraction. Yeah, yeah. Um, the problem with that though is um, when I tell you to divide, what am I telling you to divide by? Am I telling you to divide by two, or am I telling you to divide by the product of two and nine plus three? It's still ambiguous, right? But you're right, I mean, there is, there's not really division, there's multiplication by fractions. Of course, it's much easier to talk about division in a lot of different contexts than multiplication, um, especially when you're using integers. Um, but so, just so that we all know, um, this is how we do it, from left to right. So getting 288, not getting two. Right. But I will, on my part, if, if you were to get two on a test and I was that ambiguous, I'd give it to you, okay? Because I believe in being clear in your instructions and if you're not clear, then how can you expect somebody to just get the same answer as you? Um, there was a test like that, or a question like that on your test. Uh, it was something like, 7 plus y divided by 10, 10 x, something like that, or it was, yeah, 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 something like that. And then we said y is equal to 43. Then we made it, and x was equal to 2. Okay, so 7 plus 43 divided by 10 times 2. Now when you look at it this way, 10 x, the standard is 10 right next to an x means 10x together. The result of 10 times x is the number that's sitting right there. But you write it like this, and if we strictly work from left to right, like you've been taught to, 
we should divide by 10 first and then multiply by 2. Okay, but the, the person who wrote this problem meant you to divide by, well, by 20. Okay, you see the problem in that? That's what you get. That's all. Um, so if I were alone and I was doing this work, I would definitely, uh, and I saw this, I would divide by 10 first and multiply by 2. But I would get confused if I saw this. What do they mean? I'm guessing, my guess, if I had to put my money on it, I would guess that you're supposed to multiply these together first because 10x is that standard and divide by the result. But it, it just wasn't clear. And I put it on there to see if we got different answers than we did. Uh, interesting. Okay. So that's work operations. We are almost at lunchtime. Let's take a look at where we are. Let's just be, real quick we'll say, combining like terms. What makes things like terms? Why can I combine 3m plus 2m and get 5m? In what way? In a couple of ways I can think of. Huh? The m, they have the same variable. Whole numbers, but this could be like 3 and a half and 2 and 3 quarters. It would still go together, right? It comes down to the M, really. How we do it depends on how we combine those numbers. But also, can I do 3M plus 2M squared and get 5 of something? No. no. The answer is no. Okay. And why? What's different? What needs to be the same? This, this exponent. We have an exponent of 1 here and an exponent of 2 here. We can't 5 what? That it just doesn't mesh. So no. They need to be same variable, same exponent. So especially, don't be taking 4m uh, squared plus 4m squared and get 8m to the fourth. Especially when the numbers are the same, especially when the exponents are the same and you can combine them, you wind up doing it incorrectly. Right? Okay. You combine like terms to get some more or, or some collection of that term. Okay, have a good day. I'll put the homework on the website and I'll text it out. So write it down or don't. If you sign up for the text messages. Oh, you. Thank you. Who's this? Yours? Mine? Sure. <laughs> I give you my shoe. Oh, what's with this? This is my U.S. Oh, history book. Okay, book. that's what I wanted to know. Is, who's is that? Get out of here. You're confusing me. <laughs>